Christmas, what a great time to tell others about Jesus. Well, joining me now to pick up where Charlie Brown's friend Linus left off is my friend and FRC's Vice President of Christian Resources, Dr. Keenan Curitan. Keenan, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you, Tony. You know, let's start with uh, the fact you've done some notable work to help people learn about America's Christian heritage. Are, are there any surprises to you that the meaning of Christmas has kind of been lost on a lot of people? Unfortunately, no. It, it really was that way from the very beginnings of America. You know, the pilgrims and the Puritans who followed them, they really didn't want to celebrate Christmas because the meaning had been lost already back then. I mean, co-opted by people who were behaving badly, uh, drunkenness, feasting to excess instead of focusing on Jesus. So basically, they thought it had become a pagan holiday. So the pilgrims, you know how they spent their first Christmas in the New World? Building their meeting house where they would worship. Uh, but to drive it home, one of George Washington's greatest victories came overnight on Christmas at Trenton out of that famous crossing of the icy Delaware River. But victory came because the German mercenaries hired by the British were still drunk and hung over from their overzealous celebrating in Washington and his troops caught him completely by surprise. So from the very beginnings of America, people have missed the real meaning of Christmas. So it's no surprise we're seeing the same thing today. Is this um, something that we talk about here very frequently on Washington Watch and something unfortunately we're seeing on a more regular basis in our country is a, is a hostility toward biblically based Christianity. I mean, Christianity as a a cultural thing is okay because it doesn't do anything. But when you actually follow Christ, meaning that you obey him, as Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and we're following his word, there's hostility that has uh, that we're seeing to this, to marriage, to human sexuality, all those who stand for biblical truth. It, it, does that play a part in this? Absolutely. I think it, it plays a part in it because people are, as you said, moving away from a biblical worldview and away from the Christian faith that flows out of it. They're rejecting everything about it, including Jesus, who's the object of it. So it's not surprising that people are losing the reason for the season and have no desire to celebrate the coming of Jesus because they've rejected the foundation for the faith. So that said, um, one of the concerns I think that a lot of parents have, grandparents have, and, and we're seeing it in the numbers where uh, with each successive generation, we're, they're, they're moving away from Christianity. Those who grew up in the church, not so much in the church anymore, losing their faith. We, th we see the rise of the nuns. But Christmas is a great opportunity for, uh, you know, those who, you know, for whatever reason, want to avoid, quote unquote, controversy by bringing up religion at family gatherings. I mean, Christmas still is recognized by the vast majority as a religious celebration. So this is a great time to have those conversations about the whole reason that we celebrate Christmas. It was Jesus, a gift from God to mankind to save us from our sins. This is a great opportunity to share the gospel, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, of all the holidays, Christmas is probably the easiest when it comes to naturally engaging people in a gospel conversation. And as you stated from the top of the show, the reason is so many people celebrate it. It's, you know, I saw a Monmouth poll uh, last week that was 89 percent, you know, nearly nine in 10 still celebrate it. So we already have a lot of common ground to start a conversation. And in fact, I've got five practical tools that we can use uh, to do that, uh, that are just right there, ready for us. I mean, we already got them in the toolbox. Well, let's uh, let's let's start with uh, let's start with number one. All right, number one is songs. I know how you like uh, Christmas music. Our family is like your family. We love the classics. I mean, we you know we love uh, Crosby and Como and uh, Cole and Sinatra and and even a little uh, Dean Martin at times. Uh, most people like Christmas music. Uh, you know, that Ipsos uh, poll that you that you cited found only 4% who don't like Christmas music. But just think about the songs that are on the radio playing at the mall or in, in the shops. They're even in the background of our favorite holiday movies. Uh, and sure, there, there's some that have nothing to do with Jesus, like Jingle Bells or Rudolph or Frosty or whatever. But 
there are a bunch of songs uh, that are carols about Christ that people know and recognize. In fact, you know, just two out of the top 10 could be a great jumping off point for a conversation about Jesus. I mean, think about Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild, God and Sinners Reconciled. What, what does it mean, God and Sinners Reconciled? Why do we need to be reconciled to God? That could get you into a conversation about the sin that separates us from God, Romans 3.23, and God's solution of sending a Savior, Romans 6.23, uh, to, to bridge the gap between us and God. Think about joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And the words of that song could easily lead to the question, have you received Jesus as, as the king over your life? Have you opened your heart and made room to him? And that could get you to Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But Christmas carols, and songs, I think, can be a powerful yeah. tool to use as a jumping off place. It, and they can also, it can also be helpful, as, uh, going a step further, as we, as we talk a lot about biblical worldview, developing that in our children. Uh, we were just having a conversation the other day. I think it was uh, Santa Claus is coming to town. And, you know, there's, it, it's very interesting. Some of these old secular songs have a lot of biblical references in them, but the theology is way off. You know, one is, you know, we're all God's children. We have that conversation about well, what does make one a child of God? We're, we're not all God's children. We're all created by God, but we're not his children until we're adopted into the family by receiving the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And so that's what Christmas is about. It is about us becoming the children of God through receiving the gift that he has given us in being adopted into the family. And so it, it's also that time to, uh, to, to build the biblical worldview, making sure that our kids stay you know, focused on, on true biblical Jesus. Absolutely, I think you're, you're right on target there with the application. So songs, that's one way that we can get into a gospel conversation. Another is shows. All of these are going to start with us. Not surprising. I'm a Baptist preacher, still recovering. But shows, you know, movies, TV shows. You played the clip from Charlie Brown Christmas special. You know, Charlie Brown's on this search for what Christmas is all about. Linus is the only one with the answer, literally reading from the gospel story uh, there in Luke. Uh, but many of the uh, favorite shows and movies that we, we like to watch, you know, every Christmas season, have a powerful message about conversion. You know, I, I think of how the Grinch stole Christmas. That's just a perfect picture of conversion, a, a conversion experience. It completely changed it. Scrooge in the Christmas Carol. George Bailey, you know, in It's a Wonderful Life. I know that's a favorite of your family. Also experiences a transformation by the end of that movie. It's a great conversation starter then to go to a scripture like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. But, you know, invite a friend or family member over, and just talking about that Christmas show or the movie could be a great launch point for a gospel conversation. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we'll be watching Christmas Carol tonight, uh, but we, we watched the Muffet ver version of the Christmas Carol. It adds a little humor to it. All right, uh, we got three S's to go, but we're up against a break. When we come back, we'll uh, we'll pick up where we left off. All right, I'm continuing my conversation with FRC's Vice President for Christian Resources, Dr. Keenan Curitan, as we talk about five practical tools that uh, we can use to get into gospel conversations during our celebration of Christmas, the birth of Jesus. All right. Keenan, we'll pick back up uh, where we left off. We've got two of the S's down. We've got three more to go. All right, sounds good. So we got songs, we got shows. How about the symbols, the symbols of Christmas that have a foundation in the faith that could be used to communicate the gospel? For example, gifts. You know, a lot of people exchange gifts at Christmas, and that's a great opportunity, you know, to, to, and, to talk about where that practice of gift giving at Christmas came from. And you can take them straight back to Matthew chapter 2 with the wise men or the magi who visited Jesus with the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but then transition to talk about the greatest gift of all, 
the gift God gave us at Christmas, Jesus, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Paul said, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. So I, I think uh, gifts is one thing. Uh, you know, Santa is another, you know, Elf, uh, <laughs> You know, famously got really excited, Will Ferrell, about Santa uh, coming. And you could get into a conversation about the character and how he evolved over the centuries from a real historical person that we know as St. Nicholas, who was a Christian pastor in the fourth century, noted for his generosity for those in need. In fact, you know, that whole tradition of hanging stockings by the fireplace, we of a story about St. Nicholas helping a bankrupt businessman with three marriage-age daughters who needed a dowry by dropping a bag of gold in their stockings. But Nicholas loved Jesus to the point he was persecuted for his faith, even visited the Holy Land, walked where Jesus walked, and spent his life serving Jesus and preaching about Jesus. So even in the historical figure behind Santa, he was all about Jesus. And if St. Nicholas was a passionate follower of Jesus, obviously, you know, you've given your life to follow Jesus, then you could ask your friend, would they consider following Jesus as well? Uh, the Christmas tree, I mean, long history uh, that goes uh, really back to a bold statement of faith in Christ. Uh, Boniface, the German missionary in the 700s, confronted German pagans who were worshiping the Norse gods. And uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, so the story goes, one particular group was about to sacrifice the newborn son of the chief to the sacred Donner Oak, which is named for Thor, the god of thunder. And Boniface and his mission team stopped the sacrifice, started cutting down that pagan tree. And, you know, the pagan priest called for him to be killed. And the crowd said, no, hold on. If Thor is the real God, he'll deal with him. And right in the middle of that, the tree was uh, blown down by a big wind with a big crash. And the people were amazed. And Boniface took advantage of that moment by preaching the gospel, pointed to their you know, failed tree is a symbol of their failed idolatry. And then he pointed them to a nearby evergreen tree as a symbol of eternal life. And he used that to preach about the fact that eternal life is only found in Jesus. So even the Christmas tree, you can go back and use it. Uh, manger scenes. I've got one behind me over here over my shoulder. Uh, we've got a bunch of them in our house and one outside the house. In fact, I had a 10 minute faith conversation with my new neighbor from New York who bought a house here recently about the manger scene. Uh, plus my granddaughter came over today with a t-shirt with a manger scene on it with the caption, true story. And that little t-shirt has led to a bunch of conversations, but all these manger scenes give a witness to what the holiday is all about with Jesus in the spotlight and could be a launch point for a conversation. Uh, so we got a lot of tools in our tool chest, right? Songs, shows, symbols, and then worship services. I mean, a lot of churches, we're doing one. We're doing a Christmas carols and candlelight service on Christmas Eve, and then a special worship service on Christmas Day. Yeah, we will have church on Christmas Day where I am the interim pastor. And uh, you know, encouraging folks to invite a friend or invite family you know, polls show that seven out of 10 people you invite to church will actually come with you, especially if you'll throw in a meal. <laughs> and so after that, have a gospel conversation about what they heard at the church service. Um, but then I got one more, okay? And that's the most powerful tool of all. And that's the scriptures. You know, Paul said there in Romans uh, 116, the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all those who believe. And, and we should use the scriptures, uh, you know, as, as much as we can, you know, uh, put scripture verses in your Christmas cards, uh, in, invite a friend or a neighbor uh, to coffee or some hot chocolate and, and, and say, look, this is what, it, what Christmas is all about to me. And, and maybe read uh, from those gospel stories in Luke or Matthew that tell of the birth of Christ and even go to the point of telling why he came even his name, Jesus, said the angel, was given to the child because he would save his people from their sin. That's a great place to start a gospel conversation. And surely, if you're leading a family gathering, yeah. 
make that the centerpiece of your celebration, man. You know, pull the the family Bible out and 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 maybe take turns reading, or have the have one of the younger kids read, or you as a patriarch certainly read the gospel story about Jesus. Th- that is uh, one of the most important things in the family in terms of passing that faith in establishing what Christmas is all about in the minds of our children and grandchildren is is focusing on the scripture. And, and as you said, it's a great opportunity. Before we open the presents, we're going to read the Christmas story. And uh, it gets Absolutely. everybody's attention uh, because they want, to, they want to move on to the presents. But let's talk first about the greatest gift. Absolutely. That's true. But, you know, there, there are skeptics out there. And, and again, I think the scriptures are the most powerful tool that we have in answering the questions of skeptics. You know, how do we really know all this about, you know, Jesus and, you know, all these all these statements about who he is as, as God and why we should worship him and all that. But you've got these predictive prophecies right. that are so compelling with the first coming Christ. So if you're dealing with a skeptic, that's probably the best place to start. In fact, there are over 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament containing over 400 specific details about Messiah that were fulfilled in his first coming alone. And that's not to mention the types and the symbols, right? right? Yeah. You keep keep in mind this, you know, all that was written 1500 BC to 300 BC and, and way before Jesus came on the scene. And in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls are proof. That's right. That Christmas Kenan, didn't Kenan back into it. Christmas is coming. We got to leave it there. Yes. We're up against a break. Okay. Merry Christmas. Folks, stick with us. We're coming back with more.